Thank you so much for coming today. The last row of the parking lot class and like running sprinting here. So we know that you have a lot, there are a lot of events going on today, so we recognize that. And that's why we're also videotaping this um, because we know time is limited as we get toward the end of the semester. Um, so we are very fortunate that we have four of our graduates here who either are currently clerking or have clerked. Um, so just before we get started, just uh, since we have guests here, if we could close laptops, turn on phones, or turn them down, make sure they're off um, so that you can give your undivided attention, that would be appreciated. So uh, judicial clerkships uh, traditionally are for one year after you graduate from law school, and uh, they're a great way to learn about the judicial process. If you want to be a trial attorney, to see the good, the bad, and the ugly, to, uh, to have someone who's going to be a mentor for life. Um, for, there are a lot of reasons why judicial clerkships are a great thing to do. We're very lucky that we have a lot of success with our alumni securing clerkships on a lot of different courts. So we have uh, the Workers' Comp Court in Rhode Island covered, the Rhode Island Law Clerk Department covered, the Rhode Island Supreme Court covered, and Connecticut Superior Court covered just on this panel. Um, but we also have a lot of our alumni who clerk in New Jersey, who clerked in Massachusetts, We've had clerks in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, we have clerks down in Maryland uh, and, a, and a lot of other places. So, so geographically, this is a great opportunity for you to uh, start working in a legal community, start working at the highest level uh, of court, or, you know, the courts there, and um, and sharpening your legal skills. It's a, it's a great opportunity for you to really um, have that opportunity to be behind the bench with the judge and uh, and learn from that experience. So we'll go ahead and start with Drew. So this is Drew Redman. He graduated here in 2011, and uh, he clerked on the Connecticut Superior Court for three years, and he's actually going to be starting back at the courts in a different office that he'll talk about very briefly. He starts on Friday, so we're lucky to get him today. <laughs> uh, Peter Spencer is also a 2011 grad. He's currently working for a firm in Providence. He worked for, was it Justice and Delia that you were at? Yep. With uh, Rhode Island Supreme Court for one year. Danielle Default is at a firm in Providence as well, specializing mostly in business uh, law, and she worked in the Rhode Island Law Clerk Department. So they hire typically 15 to 16, 15 to 16, 15 to 16 clerks that then get assigned to all the judges in the state of Rhode Island. And Brett Bodian is a grad from last year's class, so some of you may recognize him. He's currently working for the Rhode Island Workers' Compensation Court. So, uh, so we'll go ahead and we gave them some, a list of things to, to talk about, but in terms of what did you do during your clerkship uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, what advice you have for students who are considering, who would like to apply for clerkships, what students should they be doing, classes, experiences, etc., application process, anything along those lines would be wonderful for you to share with our students. Thank you. Sure. I'll start. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, so thank you for having me today. Um, it's the uh, second time I've actually been on campus this week. Um, <laughs> after four years of away, uh, I've actually met with Veronica on Monday to talk some career stuff. So, um, just to make a point before I start, um, you guys have a tremendous resource here in the faculty and staff that work here. Um, so I encourage you to really take full advantage of that. Um, I'm six years out and I'm still meeting with them uh, talking about <laughs> career stuff. So um, uh, it's something to definitely take advantage of while you're here on campus. Um, just a briefly overview of Connecticut. Um, there's three courts and three clerk trips that you can do. Um, with, well, first with the Superior Court, which is what I did um, graduating from law school. Um, that's a, you're part of a pool of about 30 clerks, and you service all the judges um, of the Superior Court. There are about 177 judges in the, on the Superior Court in Connecticut, um, but um, you don't work with all of them. Um, some of those people are on the criminal docket, uh, family docket, uh, housing. Uh, it's mostly civil uh, law, what you guys do, um, what, what you would do for a Connecticut clerkship. You can also get a clerkship with the Appellate Court um, and the uh, Connecticut Supreme Court, so there's three main uh, courts in Connecticut. Um, and those are, you apply with an individual judge and work with uh, one judge for, the, for those. Um, like I said, I worked in the Superior Court for two years following graduation, um, but I do have some contacts that have clerked in the other courts, so um, if you're interested in finding out more information about that, I can um, definitely pass along your names or, or information to, to my contacts. Um, with the, about the clerkship itself with the Superior Court, like I said, it's about 30 people. Um, they make about 20 to 25 new hires a year, um, and then some people stay on for an additional year. So it's made up of first year clerks, and then people have been there for a few years. Um, the program is based in New Haven. Um, that's where the home office is. Um, so at the beginning of the clerkship, you go down uh, to New Haven for two to three weeks and do a, an orientation in a small group of like five or six people. So you become really close with those people. Um, you go through what a typical assignments are. The supervisors really go over everything with you. Um, in Connecticut, we have um, we don't follow the blue book. Um, it's we have our own book called the red called the red book. So um, you learn all about that uh, and. Uh, 
other things that are specific to Connecticut. So it's, it's really good in that way. Um, after that, you're assigned to uh, our, what's called a judicial district. Uh, there are 15 JD, they're called JDs. There are 15 JDs throughout the state, Hartford, Stanford, New London, New Haven. Um, they all vary in size. So some of the bigger ones are Hartford and Bridgeport and New Haven. Um, some of them are, are, are tiny. Um, typically, you'll be in, in an office with about five to 10 clerks in some of the bigger JDs um, for your year. Um, others are two to three. Um, I think there's one where you're just like one person. So um, technically, uh, normally that's a second year clerk um, that gets that position. Um, you get to request your preferences about where to work. Um, you get to list your top two or three choices. So um, if you're living in Rhode Island, um, you might want to work in the New, in the new London uh, courthouse. Or uh, I know some people who work in Stanford now live in New York City. Um, so you don't have to be a resident of Connecticut. Um, you don't have to have really any connection with Connecticut at all. Um, to get one of these clerkships. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. Um, typical week at the clerkship uh, is uh, Mondays we have what's called short calendar. Uh, and those are where the judges hear the arguable motions. Um, so in the motions to strike, motions to dismiss, motions for summary judgment. Um, and you attend court, uh, sit in the jury box, everyone wonders who you are. Uh, and you listen to all the arguments. Um, then you meet with the judge afterwards um, in chambers, talk about kind of what the arguments were, what the judge thinks about it, and that's where you get your assignment. Um, typical caseload is anywhere from maybe like you're working on five to a dozen assignments at a time, um, and you get most of those assignments from the, the, the issues that are presented at oral argument. The parties present briefs, you look at those, you look at your argument notes. Um, you get most of your assignments from the arguments that you hear or the, the arguments in your JD. Um, but that sometimes you get uh, specific cases from other JDs. So um, they're really good in Connecticut about assigning you uh, types of cases that you might be interested in. Uh, for instance, I, when I graduated, I was interested in employment law. So um, <coughs> during my orientation, I said, oh, I'm interested in employment law. Can I get some employment cases? They're like, sure. And so they actually funneled me cases from throughout the state that involved employment and labor issues. And I think in two years, a third of my work was involving labor and employment law. So I went to interview for at a, employment firms. I said, well, I did a lot of employment work in the clerkship. You know? um, and so if you have an interest in anything specific, um, they take that into consideration. They'll assign you stuff from throughout the state. Um, like I said, 85 to 90% of the work is civil. Um, you do get some criminal assignments every once in a while. But um, if you're mainly interested in criminal law, it's not really, you're not going to get a lot of that. Um, the rest of the week is spent doing research and writing on the uh, issues. Um, we're basically writing a memorandum of law, um, addressing it to the judge. Um, it really depends on the judge uh, what the assignment is. Some uh, judges will ask you to research a specific issue or a split of authority. Others will just have you write a whole memorandum on all the arguments. Um, and you submit it in the language like it is submitted to the court that the court should you know, grant the motion or or something along those lines. Um, some judges, uh, their style is they take your work and they read it through and they sign off on it and then it goes out and it's legal precedent. So um, it's really cool when you're researching and you see one of your cases out there and you know, oh, I wrote that. And people rely on that. So it's a cool feeling. Um, let's see. Oh, in my two years, um, I've worked with 26 different judges of the court. Um, so. Uh, you get a really you get exposed to a lot of different legal minds, legal opinions. I think that's a great advantage of this versus working. Um, you know, obviously the appellate and Supreme Court clerkships are nice too, but I think it's an advantage of the Superior Court that you get to work with so many different judges. Um, that's 26 judges. There's some of the top minds in the state, legal minds in the state. They're all connected. Um, they're appointed by the governor, so they're all politically connected, connected with law firms. Um, and you know, that, those are 26 judges I worked directly with and I'm on a first name basis with. Um, so I think that's a great advantage of working in a pool. Um, let's see. Uh, as far as relationships with judges, they're all different. Um, some judges are friendlier than others, just like law professors. Uh, <laughs> uh, but over, overwhelmingly, they're all very nice. Um, you know, you get pretty close to the judges in your judicial district. Um, you know, and I consider some of them friends and I still talk to them. When I see them in court, I say hi. You know, we've hung up socially too, so um, it's, it's really nice. Um, there are some judges that have a reputation for being a little bit temperamental, um, but the program, it's a nice structured program, so the supervisors that you have and the, the permanent clerks really know who those people are and they take, you know, they assign certain people to certain judges and they, they really cover that. So. Um, 
In terms of the structure, um, there's permanent staff that kind of run the program, and then there's supervisors. Um, at the beginning, you kind of submit your first assignments to the supervisors, the permanent research attorneys who review your work, then submit it to the judge. After a couple weeks, you're basically submitting your work straight to the judge on your own. Um, and supervisors cover a few judicial districts at a time. Um, in, as, in addition to the judges, you develop really great contacts with the other clerks. Um, you come, become really close. Um, you know, you, if you get lucky in a good group, you know, you're editing each other's assignments, you're bouncing ideas off each other, you're hanging out all the, you know, all the time if you want to. Um, you know, it's, it's, you get really close to these people. You, know, you share office space, they're your co-workers for a year or two years, um, and you become really close. Um, in terms of preparing in law school, um, I would definitely recommend doing the judicial externship. I did that my 2 all year. Um, I worked with Judge Clifton on the Superior Court. I know he's retired now, he's in residence here. I actually saw him the other day in the lobby, uh, which is nice, and you know, remember who I was, which is kind of cool. Um, so, uh, um, in that position, you really get to really interact with the law clerks. Uh, I remember I did it, we were on the criminal docket. I worked, uh, I sh basically shadowed for a whole semester two Roger Williams graduates who were clerking there. Um, they gave me all the tips, all the inside uh, uh, ideas, uh, information. Um, and Judge Clifford actually gave me an assignment uh, at the end of the semester about what he would actually give a, a, a clerk. So I got to do an actual assignment for him, which was really cool. Um, if you don't do that, honestly, anything that involves research and writing um, would be great. I know some judges just take summer interns. I know one of my classmates, he um, had a few different internships during the summer. He just went and worked with a judge for like a month and just followed her around. And, um, you get to interact with the clerks that way. So anything that exposes you to judges, anything that involves research and writing, even at a law firm, is beneficial. Um, classes that are good, um, civil procedure, obviously, but you know, it's mandatory. Um, remedies is a good class um, that I took. Um, you can kind of go over what judges can and can't award parties. That's, that's good to know. Um, administrative law is also really good. Um, in addition to those basic motions that you handle, the Superior Court of Connecticut also handles administrative appeals from agencies, and, uh, state agencies and local agencies. So um, you might be doing like a land uh, use appeal or um, like you know town ordinances and stuff like that. Um, so just having a sense of uh, that kind of language is, is good if you end up working on an assignment like that. Um, the application interview process, um, it's a pretty straightforward process. Um, it's all online. I have cards here if anyone's interested. I have a website on it. Um, but it's a three-step interview process. The f uh, you apply at the beginning of your 3L year. Um, and the first interview is basically, it's really straightforward. You kind of just go over your resume. Um, I did that in person in Boston at Suffolk. Uh, but now I just talked to, the, uh, to my old boss yesterday, and now they're doing those interviews by Skype. Um, so it's even easier. Um, you don't have to go anywhere. Um, if you get selected for a second interview, that's in New Haven, um, and you go to meet with the administrative staff and the director and some of the clerks who work there, you have a chance to ask a lot of questions. Um, and as part of this second interview, you take a write, you have a writing assignment. Um, so that's uh, where you kind of you get three cases ahead of time, a case law, and you read through them, and you're all prepped on it. And um, they give you a prompt um, and you know, ask you to do like a sample memo and, um, based on a, one of the principles of the cases, and you write to a judge. And, um, it's just kind of another way to kind of. Uh, see what you're all about. Um, but it's usually pretty straightforward. It's like your legal methods class. Um, pretty similar to that. Um, and then offers are made in March of your 3L year. Um, so that's really nice because you get, if you get the job, you know about it way before bar prep even starts. So um, you don't have to worry about looking for jobs at all when you're studying for the bar. So it's really nice. Um, the person who knows the office is Kyle Manning. Uh, she's in charge of recruitment. Um, again, if you're interested, we can talk more about that um, individually. Um, Anything else about clerking? Um, just want you to know that there's no standard formula for who a clerk is. Um, I kind of had the picture in my mind that it was someone who was really introverted and you know not good at oral argument or something like that when I applied. Um, but that's not true at all. Um, there are all types of clerks. There's introverts, extroverts, people um, who like writing, people who like arguing. Um, it's people from all different schools with all different types of experiences. So there's no one standard idea of who a clerk is. Um, I met a lot of different people when, when I clerked. Um, there's no mandatory uh, requisites. Um, you know, I wasn't on law review, um, so that's, that's something that shouldn't hold you back if you're not, if you don't do something like that. Um, the one common theme that I find in clerks is that they really enjoy the process of research and writing. Um, so if you're into that, um, it's, it's a good job to have. Um, you'll be passionate about your work, and then you'll uh, you know, produce a good work product if you're into the process. 
Um, Connecticut takes people, like I said, you don't have to have any connection to Connecticut. They take people from all over the country. Um, I work with people from Minnesota, California, Michigan, DC, Florida, and Canada. Uh, so they come from all over. Um, and if you have a connection to Connecticut, that's great. You can mention that, but it's not uh, required. Um, so uh, other, other thing to know is that sometimes they make mid-year hires. Um, so the hiring, um, uh, if you don't get it close up in the first try, in the winter and spring after you graduate, um, they uh, people leave the program. You sign a contract for one year, but sometimes people get other offers and they leave. Um, so they look to hire people to fill those positions. So some people enter the program uh, in the winter or spring. So if you go to the bar and um, you don't have a job and or you have one you don't like, um, you can always apply again. So keep an eye on the website. Um, there they look for people mid-term too. Um, also, don't be afraid, afraid to think outside the box. Um, uh, I wasn't even thinking about applying to Connecticut clerkship, but I met with uh, Rinsburg, and uh, she's like, oh, you're from Connecticut. Why don't you just apply? Okay, all right. So I applied, and I got the job. So, so um, the, the student might actually know who Professor Rinsburg is. Oh, sorry. She had been on the legal practice. Oh, sorry. Yes. And uh, she's part of the, she's chair of the Judicial Clerkship Committee. Um, Professor Gaiman is on that committee as well as Lord Aaron and um, another person who's on this list. Jenna Hashway, thank you, who you all probably know. So, uh, but she does a lot of prep work directly with students who are interested in applying for clerkships. And when you have interviews, a lot of them will be talking interviews with Susan, Professor Heyman. So, um, so it's just good to, to have that name on the radar. She's not physically in the building, uh, but she does a lot of film. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I forgot for, for that. Um, and, uh, and then, um, you know, I really encourage you to apply. You only, the, most of the clerks are right out of law school, so you kind of only get one chance to do this. Um, and it's something that's really valuable to you throughout your, your career. Um, it's an advantage that you have um, throughout your practice or whatever you decide to do. So it's always good to know judges. Um, so I really encourage you to apply, um, you know, even if you're not really thinking about it. Thank you. Peter? Yeah, thanks. That was great, Drew. I think I'm not to say too much. That's what I was going to say. Thank you. It's like you work so very hard. Yeah, this is amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'll just uh, kind of describe to you what my experience was. I'm clerking for the Rhode Island Supreme Court, and I'll talk a little bit about what I did in law school and what I did to try to get that job and what it's done for me. So the Rhode Island Supreme Court um, is the highest court of jurisdiction in Rhode Island. There's five judges um, who sit on the Supreme Court. Each judge every year typically has two clerks, except for the chief judge has three. And I think the chief judge keeps one clerk, kind of as a rollover every year. So there's a total of 11, right? Do the math right? 11 clerks each year at the Rhode Island Supreme Court. And I clerked with uh, Justice Indalia, who uh, is an incredible person um, and a great legal mind. So I was there for one year when I, after I finished uh, law school. And it was myself and another Roger William grad who graduated a couple years before I did. Actually, uh, Amanda was her name. She clerked one year in the clerk pool and then applied to the Supreme Court. And then she joined me up there. So she had one year of clerking experience at the trial court level before she joined with me uh, the year that we clerked for Judge Indalia. And the way that the typical week when I, you know, at, at the Supreme Court in Rhode Island was uh, Every week during the term, there would uh, be a, a oral arguments in front of the entire court, right? So you see some of the top jurists in the state uh, argue their cases before the judges, and we attended each of those, right? So you had a little pocket of like, you know, a dozen law clerks watching these lawyers argue in front of the Supreme Court. We did that once or twice a week, and we take notes and try to pay attention, but mainly just to like, just to see, you know, what, how they did it. And then we'd go back and we'd review all the briefs that were filed by both parties, and uh, and then the chief judge would choose which of the five judges would actually write the decision. And so when we got that information, Judge Indelli would come and say, Peter, Amanda, this is our case. All right, now go re review the case, the briefs again, and you know, here's what I'm thinking. You know, go review, research, and come back to me. So and that's kind of how the process went. You had the briefs come in. Before the oral argument, the, uh, the parties to the case would meet with a single judge of the Supreme Court. They'd make an appointment, they'd come and then sit with the judge in back at the courtroom area. And we'd be invited to, to go to that when our judge was the duty judge that day. So we would sit there, we would hear the different you know, uh, attorneys discuss with the judge the aspects of the case. And then at that point, that's where they would decide whether it would go to be a full brief argument, which is 30 minutes, or a short brief argument, depending on the complexity. 
So we'd have that meeting with the judge, which was neat, to see what the judge would ask them. And then after the meeting was over, we would talk to the judge and ask him about, you know, why did you bring that up? Or what do you think about this case? And then they'd actually have the oral argument. And then we'd find out which cases we would have to uh, write the decisions from. And then we would, make, at that point, just work with the judge and just talk with them about whatever the case is. Um, and there's everything. I mean, criminal cases, civil cases, everything gets funneled to the Rhode Island Supreme Court. And uh, a really neat thing is that, you know, Judge Adelia, and I think all the judges are the same way, like he would really listen to us. You know, at least he made it look like he was. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd have like real candid discussions, and he'd say, Peter, you know, what do you think about this case? You know, what do you think about this legal precedent and how it applies to this case? And so it was really interesting to be able to have those conversations with myself, my co-clerk, and the judge. And uh, I remember one, one time in particular, you know, we had the oral argument, we all came back, had a little powwow, the judge says, okay, this is what I think we're going to decide it as, go, right? And, we, and, and each of us got assigned our own case, right? So I, am, I met had some cases, I was the lead on some cases. And the one case I looked at, I reviewed the cases, I reviewed the case law, and went back to the judge and said, Judge, I don't, I don't think we just, I don't think that's right, Judge. I think this is actually the way that we should come down on this case. And I changed his mind, at least. I think I did. <laughs> but he said, okay, let me think about that, Peter. Take it back to the other judges, and who knows what happened. But eventually, that's what the decision was. But, um, but it, felt, it felt, it was great to feel like you could actually make a difference in some small way like that. Um, I did associate a lot with the other clerks, right? So you're up on the seventh floor of the, Supreme, of the courthouse. And there's, you know, the other clerks with the other judges you'd see every day. Um, each of us were in our own little chambers, which is like our little kingdom with the judge as the king. But really, it was the judge, his, uh, his clerk, his secretary, and then the two clerks. And it's close proximity. I mean, so I was sitting across from Amanda every day, all day, you know, with uh, the secretary behind us and the judge in his own room behind us there. Um, so it was close, but it was fine. I mean, and. Uh, so our day was typically either we saw the oral arguments, maybe we sat in on one of those uh, in-chamber conferences with the attorneys. The rest of the time we were reviewing, you know, researching, trying to come up, and, and really literally just drafting the decision. And we'd draft one draft, give it to our other court clerk, we'd review it and improve it, improve it, and take it to the judge. He'd mark it all up, we'd come back and, you know, do, you know, many, many versions of the decision before the judge would say, okay, this looks about right. Then he would circulate it, the other judges, they would come back with their input, and it would evolve slowly to the to, to actually have the final decision, which would be like three to four months later. Um, so that's kind of like an, in a nutshell what what we did on the on the, on the Supreme Court, and um, and it was really neat. It was it was fun. You got to know your co-clerk really well, um, the secretary, um, as well as the other judges. You know, we it's a pretty quiet place up there. So when you walk down the hallway, in fact, we would know who was walking down the hallway by like the cadence of the steps. <laughs> and so uh, it was fun to kind of get to know the, the judge in that way. Um, okay, so at that law school, I just did the typical stuff. You know, I did my best. I, you know, I tried to get as good a grade as I could. I was on law review, which was, which was great. Uh, and I think it really improved my writing. I mean, I think, you know, that's what they're looking for, I think, are people that can think about complex things and uh, that can write coherently. Um, and I think that's one of the, you know, obviously the big things that they're looking for. But uh, yeah, law review I think helped. Uh, the writing sample I submitted, I think they all, all want one or two writing samples. Um, I submitted, I don't know what it was, but I submitted it, and it must have been okay. <laughs> uh, but I do know, I, I have, I've had a few interviews with different judges, some of which I got the job, some of which I didn't, but um, uh, a couple of just funny things. So, um, and one of the, I, I, I applied for clerkship with the judge in the, in the district court, and I submitted like the same stuff I had the prior year, mostly. And uh, whatever the writing sample was, it was like a year old. And in the interview, the judge was like, oh, this is interesting about this. You know, why did you come up with that in that way? You know, and I, I, I'm like, I just, I didn't know what to say because I hadn't read it in so long. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, nah, yeah, let me think again about what that was. What was the name of that case again? You know, so that's one piece of advice is to, um, it wasn't that bad. But um, <laughs> be familiar with the material that you submit. <laughs> it something that you submitted a while ago. So. And uh, the other bit of advice as well is, is you'll hear it time and time again, but it's so, so important that, you know, edit every single thing that you submit, right? So, for example, on another interview I had, my resume was perfect. It was perfect. Except um, I was inconsistent with my commas, right, where it's like it's an option, right? If you have a list of like two or three things, the last comma is an optional comma. 
Is this making sense? Yeah. Oxford come. I don't even know what it's called, yeah. right? But Sorry. apparently I was inconsistent. And they were, you know, that came out in the interview that on these two paragraphs, you had, you know, anyway. So I mean, but, but it's just that, like, I mean, that's the fine tune that these judges are looking for. And as clerks that we do, you know, um, is they really want to have precision and, and, and all those things. Um, and then another quick thing is, is like, like, like Drew said, I would apply, apply to everything, right? Whatever you think you're interested in, you know, whether you think, you know, you're super qualified or not, I would suggest talking to the people here at the school, and they'll give you a good idea of, of what uh, would be good for you to apply to. But um, I think a lot of it deals, just boils down to fit as well. So at the end of our, end of our clerkship, the, well, in the middle of it, Judge Indelia was interviewing next year's crew, right? And so he would have me and Amanda talk to these people for a few minutes before they went in to their interview with him. And then he'd always ask us what our thoughts were about, you know. And a lot of it was just fit. A lot of it, you know, a lot of people are going up there and they've got wonderful credentials and they're all super smart. And uh, a lot of it, I think, just depends on your fit with the judge. Um, you know, they're, they're looking for someone they can associate with, that they can talk to, and they can laugh, to, laugh about things with. And so I think that has a lot. So just my recommendation would just be yourself, whatever that is, good or bad, <laughs> because you're going to be stuck with that in, that, in that, those chambers for for a long time. You know, um, so you want to be yourself. And uh, like Veronica and I were, <laughs> Judge and Delia loves dogs apparently, and like my uh, co-clerk Amanda loves. I mean, she had like four pictures of dogs on her desk, and uh, the secretary loved dogs, and I'm not a dog person. <laughs> but I knew, like in the interview, I didn't bring that up. In the interview, I, I, somehow I knew that the dogs were a big thing, in the, and I was like, "Yeah, that's great, Judge. It's a beautiful looking dog you have on your desk, you know." But, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I would have lost the job or not, but I just kept that to myself. Like yeah. I know, I, or the Patriots, you know, whatever <laughs> it is. It was, yeah. you know, but, uh, anyway. Um, anyway, so those are some thoughts. I mean, I'm sure things would come to my mind as we go along, but so I have a question for you guys. So, how many of you are thinking of applying for a clerkship in Rhode Island? Outside of Rhode Island. Okay, good. So, I, as Veronica said, I was in the Rhode Island Supreme Court Law Clerk Department. It used to be called the pool. We don't refer to it as the pool anymore, apparently. I just don't call it the pool. Um, but it's the Rhode Island Supreme Court Law Clerk Department trial law clerk department. Uh, so, basically, uh, if our years have been, Peter and I, my years had been reversed, he'd probably be reviewing some of <laughs> the draft decisions that I wrote. So I, in Rhode Island, in the law clerk department in Rhode Island, you're not assigned to a judge. Don't, you're never assigned to a judge. I was like hammered into it. You're assigned to a calendar, a county, or a calendar, or both. So it's four counties in Rhode Island, um, Washington, Newport, Providence and Bristol are combined, and Kent County, which is like Warwick. Um, Kent County has the out of um, out of uh, business calendar that's out of Providence. There's the in-state, the out-of-state business does everybody else, and Providence does basically Providence, Cranston, Warwick. Uh, not Warwick, Warwick's in uh, Kent County. So I was originally assigned to uh, the MERS calendar, and if you don't know what that is, don't bother learning it right now, but I was the MERS calendar in Kent County, and it was a pretty slow calendar. It was a lot of uh, dealing with the fallout of like mortgage foreclosures and challenging the assignments of loans and, you know, very, very interesting stuff, um, <laughs> but it actually is very interesting, but uh, so I was originally in there, and then I got moved to Providence and was kind of like a floater, worked with a little bit of everything, and uh, then got assigned to assist and then basically be second on the motion calendar in Providence with uh, Judge Leach, uh, who was on it for, I think he had the longest run on the motion calendar. So motion calendar is all of your dispositive, non-dispositive. So non-dispositive, all your discovery motions, motion to compel, all that stuff. Uh, dispositive, motion to dismiss, motion for summary judgment, those types of motions. And he had those, and then he was a very active judge, so he would pick up, if there was something like another judge couldn't fit on their calendar or they were going away, he would pick up, you know, things like that, uh, and which really means that me and um, 
the, my friend John Ryan who went to Suffolk that was on the motion calendar from the beginning, we would have to have more work. Uh, but it was great. He was, so not being assigned to a judge, being assigned to the motion calendar, I was with Judge Leach for that whole time and he uh, is amazing. I really loved working for him. I probably owe, owe most credit for my current job to him. Uh, which I'm eternally grateful for because I landed in a great spot. And so with Judge Leach, he's very, I would say, just like uh, Justice Indelia, how you described uh, Justice Indelia, it was, he, he really listens to you. And he'll put you to your paces and you'll discuss the case, you'll read the papers, you'll discuss it. But then it's really up to you to write, uh, you know, for Judge Leach, a draft decision. Uh, most other judges for the motion calendar would be like a, a memorandum of law, but Judge Leach would read the entire decision into the record. It was very thorough, um, you know, kind of closing the grounds for appeal or, you know, if we weren't careful, opening the grounds for appeal. Uh, but, we, you know, we, we worked very closely with him. Uh, I got to see everything. We got to see zoning appeals. We got to see, that's why, um, she was referencing admin law. I mean, take it, don't take it, but it would be helpful if you were to get a position on the motion calendar um, or any position in the trial court, uh, clerk department. But it was, it, I had a great time with the judge. I, you're considered a state worker. Uh, there's great benefits that come along with being a state worker. However, I did not keep state workers hours. I worked very long hours. I worked on the weekend. I, and that was because the work had to get done. Um, we were looking at like 14 dispositive motions a week, uh, which you can imagine the papers on that are huge volumes of, of papers that you have to read. But I learned so much. My writing improved, I guess, in my opinion. I think in the judge's opinion, too. Uh, and it, it was very helpful uh, to that. Uh, and then so how I got there, and I agree with everything that Drew and Peter said, you know, you should, I was not on law review, I was on moot court. Um, I'm married, I have two kids. This is, um, this is my second go around as a competitive figure skater for, and then a coach for 18 years. So this is my like, this is like my do over or whatever, <laughs> reinventing myself. But so, so I had choices, I couldn't do both and I really enjoyed um, the oral argument in moot court and getting on my feet. But I made a very conscious effort to supplement not doing law review with taking every clerkship I could possibly get my hands on, whether it was just an internship. So the summer after my 1L year, I had an internship with Judge McConnell, who's a federal district court judge. He was amazing. Um, he, not all judges do this, but he allowed us to use the decisions that we drafted for him as a writing sample, so I had two writing samples that were published uh, opinions. Uh, he actually, at the end of our clerkship, like framed the, the first page for us, so it's like hanging on the wall in my office. Um, he's a tremendous, tremendous man and a great mentor. Um, I did my first semester 3L year, I did a judicial externship with Justice Goldberg on the Rhode Island Supreme Court. Uh, that was, so I got to see kind of what Peter was talking about. It's very, like, you get very, very close. Um, the, in, the externs are in a little closet that's like the open people in the table and there's three of us. But um, I learned a lot watching oral arguments and, and going through the process with the judge and, and uh, their law clerks is very interesting. And there's a lot at stake. So you know, there is a lot of responsibility that comes along with it. Uh, and then I applied for the trial law, we're not in the Supreme Court, whatever. I was in the clerk department. And I applied for that. Like Drew said, one of the great parts about it, by March you know whether you have a job. That was wonderful, not having to think about that, going into bar, bar prep study and filling out applications. Um, so I would, I would just say that if I look back on it and talking about it to you all today, I actually really miss it. Like, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I miss my judge, but you become very close. We go, he, we're called his team. We're his team, and whoever's birthday it is in the team, which is the court stenographer, the sheriff, uh, the law clerks, uh, who 
else? We have his court clerk, whose birthday it is in the team. We all go out for lunch, and you know he invites us to attend seminars, and um, I think there might even be some prepping <laughs> um, that that they'll speak at, and and it becomes like a like you said, like a little like a family. Like you know you, you get to know them really well. So it was. Uh, a very, very good experience. Uh, I would recommend it, uh, especially if it's a one. It's one year. It's not gonna. If you're lucky to get it, you'll be a better writer, a better researcher. Um, coming out of it, you'll know. You'll see everything in one year. We see like everything you could imagine. Like you're doing like zoning appeals, and then actually, and then this is one of the. I'll leave you with this. As I said, Judge Leach was a very active judge, where he would love to just take, you know, someone could fit something into their calendar, he would, he would volunteer to take it. Uh, and I ended up writing a 62-page uh, decision after a four-month, now this is on the motion calendar, so this is a little awkward, it's not the trial, this wasn't a trial, um, motion regarding the discovery rule when the plaintiff, uh, under the exercise of reasonable diligence, should have discovered their injury on a wrongful adoption case. And it was a so wrongful adoption, just like tort of misrepresent negligent misrepresentation or negligence, um, was that if the adoptive parents knew of the child's medical and, and social history, if they had known they likely would not have adopted the child. That's the claim. I mean, I can say they never got rid of their child. They're still, but it, it is it is so intriguing, and it was a very very long process that the judge and I bonded over because it was there's a lot at stake, and um, you know there, it was it was it was hard, and you had a lot. There were a lot of facts to consider. So that was probably a great swan song to end my clerkship. So I would recommend going for it, try everywhere, apply to everything. I'm done. Done. <laughs> okay. So uh, briefly, I, I just want to, you know, a lot of this overlaps, obviously, so I just wanted to touch on sort of my backstory and how I ended up being uh, a clerk at the workers' comp court, and then briefly about the workers' comp court and how it's different from the other courts. Um, I didn't set out to be a clerk. In fact, my primary target was the Navy JAG. Uh, all before law school and, and through most of law school, uh, did an internship at the Navy base in Newport my first summer, and then uh, in Sicily with the Navy JAG my uh, my second uh, year summer, which is fantastic. Love the Sicily; it's amazing. And if you haven't been, you should definitely go. <laughs> better than the rest of Italy. Uh, wine's better, food's better. Anyway, um, but didn't love the Navy as much as I thought. Didn't apply and got back to my 3L year and started to scramble and say, okay, you know, what am I gonna do now? Because I was pretty sure I would have, you know, gotten picked up. Um, so uh, fortunately though, along the way in law school, I loved, I loved researching and writing and, and arguing, uh, you know, did the moot court thing and under Danielle's excellent leadership and uh, loved that and then wrote on to law review my third year even though I didn't get on before, I, I managed to convince the uh, editor at the time to publish something that I, that I really felt strongly about. Uh, and I took every writing and litigation class I could while I was here. Um, I, you know, I ended up getting bored with the traditional uh, classes, and, and so I took a criminal lit and drafting class, an appellate advocacy class, uh, and just you know, wrote as much as I possibly could, which you should do even if you don't want to go into clerkships. You know, that's what you're going to do if you're going to practice. Um, and I credit that experience with basically, you know, getting me into the, the workers' comp court at the last minute. Uh, so the workers' comp court is different uh, from other courts in Rhode Island in that it is one of two um, courts that has its own direct appellate process. Um, the, the traffic tribunal, I think, is the only other one. Uh, you guys, is that? Yeah. So, uh, you know, whereas there's no intermediate court of, of appellate review in Rhode Island, you know, of general jurisdiction, it goes right into the Supreme Court. Uh, we can have trials at the comp court, and then the division within the comp court will take, will take direct appeals, and it's also an appeal of right. So, it's busy, because, you know, if you lose, what does it cost you to appeal, but whatever the filing fee is. Um, so, I get a trial record and memos from each party, and basically, have to dig through, uh, you know, 
the stuff and, and figure out who's right and who's wrong. Uh, just like they do at the Supreme Court, we will have oral arguments on, on the appellate, you know, on the case. Uh, there's a panel of three judges. I work for, uh, you know, uh, technically, uh, you know, Chief Judge Ferrari is the chief of the court, but um, Deborah Olson, Judge Olson, is the appellate author on all the decisions. So she doesn't take any trials because, you know, that would be too confusing. So she handles all of the appeals. And then the other two members of any given panel are uh, two trial court judges, except for the judge that would have had the case. Uh, so they rotate through. Um, <clears throat> so most of my day job consists of writing writing the appeals and you know we do the powwow thing, discuss the case, I get to have input on you know where I think the outcome should be and then you know research the issues in the law and I think I'm close to changing somebody's mind at the moment about you know after but but we'll see. Um, and uh, you know it's it's great because you get to have that sort of like interaction and, and you're not just told to go and do something. Um, so you know you do feel like your you know your input is valued. Um, and I like to write and research, so it's, it's also very helpful. Those decisions take a few weeks at a time, maybe a month or longer. Um, another primary responsibility of the uh, of a law clerk there would be uh, basically a bench memo for the oral arguments um, before you know you write the decision. So the, the case will get appealed, and at that point you're not doing much research, you're just looking at the record, identifying the issues, and putting together a three-page you know, bench memo. Um, but at the same time, I do get some trial experience because although I'm not required to write trial decisions, uh, there are eight trial judges uh, you know, below and a lot of times they'll come by and ask me to figure out some discrete issue and you know, take a day to just you know, answer this question or that. And uh, you know, so, so I get some variety there and I get to network with the rest of the judges. Um, and you know, I think that as everyone said, clerking is just great to basically start your career if you if you're not sure exactly where you want to go next uh, or if you're not you know promised a, a big law job in Manhattan uh, it's it's just great it's great experience researching and writing and uh, getting to know people uh, so you know between the judges that I've met and the attorneys that you know come into the court and even even across the hall in, in criminal court or family court you know I'm in the building you're seeing these people you're going out to you know uh, networking events and, and you're hanging out with the other clerks so uh, it's it's incredible, you know. It's been a great experience. I think. Any questions? questions? I, was, okay. I just wanted to add a couple. So, as much as we all made it sound like it was amazing and it's you know changed or it was a great way to start our careers, it's not for the you know faint of heart. You will work a lot. Um, you there is a, a lot of writing. You. There's a lot to do, and in anything that you do, what I found through my experience, and this is what I did in law school, the clerkship, and now my current job, um, I said yes to everything. I, I, can you help do this? I got that wrongful adoption case because I said, we were sitting with, John and myself were sitting in the judge's office, and he's like, I got this, this thing, it might be on this month, it might be on next month, you know, any of you, would you wanna do you know, it's like wrongful adoption. I'm not that familiar with them. I'm like, well, I'll do it. It's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Four months later, like 15,000 medical documents later, you know, that I'm combing through it. But you say yes. So it's, it's, if you're someone that is not afraid of hard work, if you're someone that knows there's an answer somewhere, that you want to get to the closest you can get within to the truth, to where, you know, the law is not black and white. It is gray, otherwise we wouldn't have jobs. But if you're that person that wants to narrow in on the discrete issue and, and make, help the judges make good law, you know, good law, then, and you, you do that tirelessly, this is the job for you. If you're someone that doesn't, that's like, eh, I don't really, I only get paid for 8.30 to 4, and I'm supposed to have a half hour lunch every day, or whatever it is, and, and you don't like to take work home, it wouldn't necessarily be the job for you. But I promise you, and I think that you're, you're, you're on your way there too, but it translates into a great job. I'm, I'm happy where I am. I'm happy with the knowledge that I amassed over a year. Um, I'm so proud to have worked with that judge, I'm so proud to have had an internship with Judge McConnell. Like it is your network 
um, into Rhode Island especially, and it's the people that help like build you up um, and kind of carry you to the next level of your career. So, you know, there's it's hard work, but the benefits are, are have, for me, have been amazing. Yeah, I mean, you're certainly going to be supported, and the judges, I don't know, in my experience at the Concord, I'm sure it's the same. You know, everyone's interested in getting to know you and your backstory and where you come from and what you want to do, and they're, you know. I would even say, you know, aggressively willing to basically put you out to people that yeah. need to meet. Yeah. Um, and so it's, you know, there's really, I'm, I'm treated well and I'm, and I'm really fortunate that, you know, I, I landed in this position and definitely recommend it, whether it's the school or that, you know, um, it's a great, it's a great first step. And to add on to, add on to that too, um, I know in Connecticut, uh, I've been on, you know, numerous interviews and I know sometimes the firms say, well, we only hire clerks or the last four hires we made have all been clerks. Um, and I've heard that multiple times. So it's not like that with every firm. Don't be worried if you don't get a clerkship, you're not going to get a job. But some firms do like that, uh, and it gives you an advantage uh, in certain certain uh, situations. If I could add, so as you may have done some math, so Rhode Island only has about 25, 26 clerkships from year to year. Uh, New Jersey has 485 every year. So that just gives you an idea. So Connecticut, Rhode Island have law clerk departments. Um, New Jersey has one clerk per judge typically not more than one. So so we have a lot of our students from the New York, New Jersey area. We have students that have never set foot in New Jersey who have gotten clerkships in New Jersey. So, and again, I think Peter alluded to this, our students, who, our grads who are currently clerking are looking through the applications for next year. So so there's a great pipeline that we have of students who open up letters first when they see it's from Bristol, Rhode Island, and they know it's one of ours, they're gonna look at that letter and they're gonna tell the judge, you need to interview this person. So just know that that network does exist. Recognize that Rhode Island and even Connecticut with only 30 clerks you know, for their entire court system is pretty small. Um, Massachusetts hiring has been a little bit unpredictable over the last few years. They're trying to normalize it a little bit more now. Um, but they have had consistent hiring in the last two years, but they are moving more toward a research attorney clerkship pool. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this. So instead of having just one year term clerks, they're looking to hire more what are called research attorneys, which would be permanent positions, so they have more reliable budget funding for it. Uh, whereas the term clerks are considered temporary, so sometimes if there's budget freeze, that's the first position to go. So, so that, but they don't anticipate going to fully research assistant attorney positions for a few years. So there still are opportunities to be on the current student, on grad of ours, at Venture. Yeah, uh, Massachusetts. We're currently clerking right. up in Massachusetts right now, who's a great resource in Massachusetts is an interest, of interest to you as well. So there are a lot of great resources. Some of them are highlighted in this handout. The Vermont Guide to Clerkships does state by state. Uh, again, a lot of the deadlines for next year haven't come up yet, but very reliably from year to year, they're very consistent. So you can look at that uh, and certainly work with our office. We'll work with the, uh, the collection committee as well, we'll in touch with our alumni, so that you are as prepared as possible to ultimately get these opportunities because from year to year, we have great success in our alums, our grads going out there and getting these jobs. So I um, so want to do whatever we can to help you. And in the fall, we do have Carol Farnoli come on campus to talk about the Lockport Department hiring. Specifically, we also had um, the attorney from Massachusetts who does hire and come and talk as well. So, um, so if there are states that you're thinking Tennessee, let me know and we'll figure out you know what we can do out there. But um, so just know there are opportunities everywhere. It's a great experience. So we're here to help if you have um, any needs. So any other questions? Veronica, so Amanda Jacober, am I saying it correctly? Yes. So she, I, I met with her in anticipation of her interview. I know she met with a couple other uh, alums, and I met with her. Um, you know, I couldn't you know, repeat most of what I said, but, uh, <laughs> but I, you know, when you've gone through it and you know what to expect with the interview and then just in general, like how I said to you, you are never assigned to a judge. Like, don't, so when you're asked that, it's like, well, I'd like to be in this county or that county or whatever. So we worked on that, but, you know, she did a great job, but she was very prepared, I th in, in my opinion went through, we practiced, and we just, and we talked, and there were things I said, stay away from this, definitely mention this, you know, so, so there's a good network of uh, law clerks that will make themselves available to, to help you. It makes our, our law degree more valuable, the more clerks, we're kind of in a, we're, like, I know that it was like, there's 15, so it was always like, we always wanted to have more than half of them from Roger Williams. Then there was like someone came in mid year last year, so it was tied. And there would, you know, I would chide my John who went to Suffolk. It's like, well, you know, they needed me on motion gallery. So, you know, so we would joke about that, but we take a lot of pride in it. And it is, there are limited spots, 
but you could go from Rhode Island to New Jersey or New Jersey back into, you know, it's, it's a really good experience. So. Right. Any other questions? One thing I will say, when Carol does come in the fall, she does not allow us to videotape her. So if that is something, you, I'm sure you know why. <laughs> so if that is something you're interested in doing for the Rhode Island Law Clerk Department, I would strongly encourage you, once we obviously advertise the date, once it's secured, it's typically the third week or so of September, um, that's a great opportunity for you to see her in action, uh, get an understanding in terms of what she's looking for, writing samples, the S2 for two, um, interview prep and things like that, so she doesn't hold anything back. Um, so that's just something to, just planting a seed in the future. But then obviously if you do get interviews with we'll contact with alumni like Danielle and like, you know, um, so uh, Drew and, and Brett, depending on what, where you're going. So, so we're here to support you. So anything else? Any questions? Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.